HBCU Digest, welcome back. Uh, privileged to be joined by a good friend of the show, uh, Bowie State University and Howard University graduate, and Leslie Hall, director of HBCU programs for the Human Rights Campaign, here to talk today about the second annual HBCU Out Loud Day, which was actually last week. Um, but as we know, uh, it, it, LGBTQIA uh, outreach and, and um, traditions are welcome on HBCU campuses every day of the year. So Brother Hall, um, always an honor to have you on, my man. It's good. To, it's good to be back. It's good to be back. I actually just ran across that email from you a year ago, and we did that um, that podcast kind of conversation. <laughs> that was really cool. We've been talking since you were a student at Bowie, man. Yeah, um, yeah, right. Every, right. Now then, every now and then you pop up. <laughs> every now and then you pop up, but it's all. Gotta, it's gotta make sure the people know I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> it's something good that's gonna happen every time you. So every time you show up, Amen. man. So we, it's, it's always an honor. Um, Out Loud Day. So this is the second annual installment of this nationwide uh, campaign to to get uh, historically black campuses talking about acting on um, loving on brothers and sisters in our LGBTQIA communities. Um, tell us about this year's event. What separated from the inaugural event? And are there some campuses that you uh, had a chance to work with or brothers and sisters on campuses that you had to, a chance to work with that really stood out um, for this year's programming, even in the midst of the COVID-19 response. Right, right. So thank you again. It's always good good to, to be with you. Um, so this year, um, so HB Cell Loud Day is a is a day of, 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 of LGBTQ awareness for the HBCU community. Um, and we started it last year because coming out day didn't quite cut it uh, for the for the HBCU community as it relates to celebrating all that is LGBTQ on campus. And so um, we wanted to, to create a day where uh, HBCUs would be able to celebrate the successes that they were having with diversity milestones. Uh, we wanted them to be able to create a day to celebrate their, their LGBTQ alumni in various ways. Um, but we also wanted to create an opportunity for these institutions to to set goals and to set plans and to share um, share some maybe some 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 challenges that they are having and, and, and so it, it can also uh, provide an opportunity for shared learning and best practices and so uh, last year was the first year we we had it um, and last year it was phenomenal um, we had several institutions participate by by tweeting it's a largely a social media. Um, driven type of event, and you know, last year we we had uh, several institutions tweet out about it. Uh, several students um, and administrators participated in it. And what we do is we create several call to actions, and uh, we create a, a a sheet so students can write in, you know, why they are living out loud, or administrators can talk about uh, living out loud, and and they post it on social media, and that's how we get a lot of the traction traction going with hashtags and whatnot. Uh, last year, we had a, a, LGB, uh, a briefing on camp on uh, on Capitol Hill, excuse me, and we partnered with the HBCU Congressional Caucus that Alma Adams, uh, Congresswoman Alma Adams started. And we also partnered with the Equality Caucus of, of Congress. And they hosted us on, on, on Capitol Hill. And we had a wonderful briefing just on what can uh, our legislators do nationally to support HBCUs in their quest for um, for for better inclusion, and so uh, you know that always comes with funding. It's not that a lot of times that our HBCUs don't have the will; it's just that they don't always have the financial resources to put uh, into play. And so this year, uh, because of COVID, we couldn't do uh, we personally couldn't host any in person events. Um, so we just kind of beefed up our social presence a bit. But you know, luckily and. To, to our surprise, we had several institutions um, that are back on campus that, you know, uh, decided to um, to host events on campus, socially distanced. Most of them were outside. Several of them were virtual, uh, but they hosted their standalone events for HBC Out Loud Day. Um, and, and it was wonderful. And so what we did on our end was we created um, some HBCU Out Loud boxes where, where we put masks, um, hand sanitizers, uh, all sorts of, uh, of things that uh, students would need in order to participate uh, safely in those events. And we shipped them out to many institutions. And that's why you saw folks with shirts on, with, the, with our masks on. And 
um, hand sanitizers and whatnot. So it was it was a really fabulous day. And um, we had a lot of participation from alumni, administrators and students uh, on last Wednesday. Do you think that there is a, a benefit from being able to be forced into a lot of virtual meeting and a lot of digital engagement? Um, because I know that, you know, travel is always a, a constraint for some institutions and it's a barrier. Um, Large institutions can afford to do it. Smaller ones cannot. Um, is the virtual part of this something that helps or do you think it's a hindrance because it's, it's just harder to to get people to say I'm all in and I'm all in to talk about these things because th there's no there's no vacation in it to, to put right. it out. So I, I kind of have like a two prong feeling when it relates to to this virtual environment. On one hand, it does allow us to engage more folks. Um, and, it, and it allows us to uh, that, you know, like the simplicity of it all, like you really don't have to leave your house to participate. Um, but I think on the other end, um, some things just don't have that same like zest mm -hmm. or zeal rather that that it once had. And, you know, I was a proponent very early on in this pandemic. I was like, I, let's not just recreate everything virtually just because we did it last year. Some things. It's just going to have to wait <laughs> until we could do it in person again because uh, you don't want to cheapen the experience. You don't, and, and you don't want to just do anything. Um, but for and, and that works for some things. But for HBCL Loud Day in particular, I feel uh, since it's really largely uh, a, a social media driven day anyway, um, it, it it didn't really matter. But for for some other events that we had, we certainly have seen a shift in interest and a shift in, um, you know, the experience that folks that folks are having. One of the remarkable things that the HRC does, um, not only with engagement and, and discussing cultural and infrastructure issues related to LGBTQIA um, inclusion on campus, is the, the, the training and the monitoring that goes along with how do we become more inclusive? Um, with HBCUs having fewer students on campus, fewer faculty, if they are on campus at all, do you think that there there is momentum loss, especially in the in the things that you've done over the last two years, where you've had presidents come in, you've had students right. come in, right. you've engaged with the C Congressional Black Caucus, so many positive things happening, and even at the same time, there were a lot of stories about mistreatment of brothers mm -hmm. and sisters on campuses over the last two years. Do you think that you you lose a step or are you kind of maintaining because we can't physically be together and that the, the engagement is different from a reporting standpoint? Right. Right. So I think you're on to something. When the when the pandemic first started um, in March and they were sending students home in the middle of March and and after spring break, uh, one of the things that we did was that we reached out to our institution partners and we asked them to remember LGBTQ students. Um, you know, we understand the pandemic and we understand the, the, the risks that are related to that, but we also don't want to force uh, LGBTQ students back in homes that, and in communities, you know, essentially that are just unsafe. And so uh, many LGBTQ students stayed on campus um, and, and, you know, the, the, these institutions put in various protocols and policies in place so that they can remain on campus. Um, and, and many of them remained on campus throughout uh, the semester. And honestly, the campus was a, a safer option for them. Um, and so now, you know, and, and we did that for a number of reasons. One, because we certainly wanted to uh, keep, keep looking out for, for students, but two, we wanted to keep this on the forefront of their minds. And so you're absolutely right. When uh, that was one of my worries in, in uh, like going in the middle of the summer when we would normally do a good bulk of our programming with administrators and staff. Um, I was concerned that these institutions were gonna be so consumed with COVID and, and you know this new environment that LGBTQ issues would kind of go on the back burner. And in many cases, uh, we've experienced that in the past without COVID. <laughs> so we can, uh, you know, one could only assume that with this new global health crisis that's happening right now, folks are not really trying to listen to what's happening with some stuff that, that you know, they really not, that's really not in their faces. And so 
we created several different um, innovative opportunities to engage with administrators. We had a fireside chat with Dr. Kimbrough uh, from Dillard and our president, Alfonso David, which had a, a significant amount of views, particularly from HBCU presidents, and that kept some of the best practice talk going. Um, and uh, we we sent uh, them some care packages, particularly administrators. We sent uh, many HBCU presidents care packages with our logo and information and some some uh, pamphlets in there just to talk about you know how to support LGBTQ students in the midst of COVID. Um, and, and again, just reminding them that as you begin to make plans to either go back to campus or do a virtual, that you know we should always consider a third option for students who just really have extenuating circumstances. And and you know I don't have to tell you this, but for you know HBCUs really are the last resort in many of our communities, and that's just not with housing. That's that's with meals. That's with a, a lot of things. And so um, many HBCUs stepped up. Um, and, and and supported students in the midst of this, and and we've and we've gotten favorable reviews from it. And so um, today, I don't feel like uh, you know we have been uh, necessarily left on the wayside in terms of the type of work that I do, but it is something that I'm consistently uh, not worried worried about it. But it, it is on a on the top of my mind because I, I don't want. Yeah, I don't want I don't want the progress that we've made to be lost um, because of the because of the pandemic. Do, do you think that you will have um, if and when we get back together, whether that's in a year, whether that's in a right. two years? Um, right, right. That you mentioned earlier innovation. Do you do you foresee that engagement and programming looks different when we return to campus or is it let's maintain what we were doing because we were making a lot of positive steps before this thing kicked off? Yeah, I don't want to sound like Trump, but I want to get back to where we were. <laughs> like, you know, um, we we were doing some good stuff and some things really need to be in person. You know, I think that in the age of manipulating, uh, you know, all this type of technological manipulation, uh, a lot of the conversations that we would have with faculty and staff and administrators were very sensitive conversations. And these conversations, while we can, you know, do it uh, virtually, uh, it, it, it's not the same experience from when a, when folks can sit in a room with an expert uh, or with someone of, of a shared lived experience and, and be able to have those conversations without fear of being recorded or, or, or taking a, something out of context and, and so on and so forth. And so one of the things that I always share when we're doing uh, leadership trainings at these campuses and we have staff in the room, administrators in the room, and I say, and I tell them, this is probably going to be the first time and the last time you ever get to ask anything you want related to this topic and then not end up on CNN. <laughs> and, you know, and because, you know, a lot of folks are afraid to, to really get down into the nitty gritty of, of this work. And we create, we, we provide them a space and an opportunity to ask those hard questions, to talk about the identity of the institution and what it means to embrace LGBTQ students and if is that really in conflict? We we talk about that, um, and I, you know I can't say that I'm comfortable with doing that over Zoom, you know. And so some things um, I think we 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 will need to return back to in person um, convenings, but some things you know we can certainly deepen. You know, like HBC Allowed Day that was wonderful. You know, there there was several virtual op events that were that were widely attended. And so I think we may, you know, embrace some virtual um, opportunities in that regard. But uh, a lot of our in-person stuff and our regional summits and the campus, because the other thing, and I'll end on this, the other thing about the in-person stuff was it it allowed the campuses to own this work. Right. You know, our offices are in D.C., in nice little plush liberal D.C., where everything's gay and great. You know, the laws are supportive <laughs> and all that. <laughs> this work needs to be in these areas where, you know, it needs to be in their face. The, the yeah. campuses need to have institutional buy-in uh, to what's happening. And so, um, you know, that's the other thing. We want the campuses to begin to embrace this work and own this work. And you can't do that on a Zoom call. So I was going to ask you, but is it the right time? Uh, it, first of all, it's always the right time for tolerance. 
Right, but right. One right. of the things that you you have talked about, you you've taught me, you've taught thousands of other people throughout the sector, is we want we want safety and equity. We want yeah. safety and equity in these conversations. And given everything that's going on, do you feel like even now, um, with with so much partisan divide and so much social divide, that when brothers and sisters are are, are courageously out there having these conversations, that they will be safe. And I don't I don't yeah. mean just in a physical sense, yeah. but they won't be ostracized. They won't be harassed. They won't be bullied online and things like that for trying to get everybody to do the right thing. Is that are we in a good place for that? Yeah, I think the ground the ground is ripe for those conversations today. Um, you know, President Obama has a mixed kind of history as it relates to HBCUs. But one thing that he did do that really helped the work that I do now is he embraced LGBT, the LGBTQ community tenfold. And I think that seeing a black man embrace um, my community and our issues the way that he did kind of forced a conversation to happen. Um, and since then, uh, just the politics of the country, some the, the unapologeticness of the student leaders on these campuses are really forcing us to, to have these conversations with administrators. Now, uh, you know, when students come to our leadership summit, we prepare them to do a number of things. It's not just, you know, get out there and and make good trouble and make noise. Like, of course, we want to prepare you for that. But we also want you to understand the realities of your community and your state. Some places, many places, uh, you can still be fired for, mm -hmm. for being out. Um, many places you can be denied services for for being out. And, you know, and, and in some communities, it's still, you, you, there can be physical harm, particularly for our trans brothers and sisters in these areas. And so you have to be smart and, and you have to, you know, do what you can do. And maybe, maybe your contribution to the work that we're doing is uplifting a tweet or, or sharing this video or, you know, or whatever the case is. Maybe that's your contribution because of where you are today. But uh, we certainly want to prepare folks to to get out there because that is how visibility um, is 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 part of the game. And that and, and you know I tell administrators all the time, presidents, when they are trying to diversify their faculty and administrators, I tell them students can't be what they can't see. Mm -hmm. And if you know when I was on campus, uh, I don't remember an out LGBTQ person in administration. Um, I don't remember an out LGBTQ person on the faculty. <laughs> you know, like. Uh, and I'm sure that would have gotten around if 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 he or she or they were out. And so, you know, it's it's a conversation that just given the the climate that we're in, um, I don't think we can afford not to have it. One of those conversations is coming up next month. Um, tell us a little bit more about that convening um, and what the the HBCU community should expect. Um, how we can participate and contribute to that. Certainly. So. Uh, you know, for the last 15 years, we've been hosting um, an annual leadership summit where we bring uh, LGBTQ students from all over HBCUs from all over the country to D.C. for a week long uh, leadership development experience and, and uh, identity development experience. Well, this year, fortunately, we were unable, excuse me, to do that. So instead, we're going to host a one day symposium. Uh, and it's going to be public lectures, networking opportunities, um, and panel discussions uh, from from renowned, wonderful um, presenters on these very conversations. We're going to talk about student protests and the history of student protests at HBCUs. We're going to talk about uh, some, the discontent of LGBTQ students on campus and why uh, it's so important for us to to have these conversations. And so it's going to be a full day of, of events. Um, we're just finishing up the um, we're just finishing up the the flyers and everything to go out uh, really soon. And so um, most most every mostly everything will be via StreamYard. Um, so you could watch it on Facebook Live, YouTube Live. Um, there are going to be some sessions because of the conversation that will be. Um, that will be uh, in, a, in a separate kind of breakout room. And there's a way for you to register for that as well. But all of our keynote, um, all of our keynotes and, and public lectures will be via StreamYard. And it's gonna be a wonderful opportunity. And then we're gonna end the day with a, um, with a, with a panel 
uh, discussion from uh, I'm not sure if you from, if you've watched this, but on HBCO Max there was a show called Legendary, and it's about mm -hmm. the house and the ballroom. And so we have the winners of of that um, of that of that show to to do a panel to talk about uh, ballroom and the LGBTQ community and HBCUs and how it all intersects. And and so it's going to be a good day, um, and it's going to be a full day of opportunities to engage and to learn and to have discussions. I thought you were just going to say you had free from polls coming through. You, I was about to. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had folks from polls in 2019. We did. We had folks from polls in 2019. Leslie yeah. Hall, HRC, um, Human Rights Campaign. My brother, we appreciate you all the time. We thank you uh, for thank the you. work that you're doing on behalf of brothers and sisters, uh, not just in the sector, but worldwide. Uh, we appreciate you, my man. Thank you for coming on and sharing with us today. No worries. And I appreciate you for, for never having an issue with lifting up the work that we're doing. And so, uh, you know, can always count on HBCU Digest and Jared to, to make it happen. Thank you so much.